Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on cultural policy at European Union level. Um, we're happy to bring this webinar to you from the European Music Council. My name is Simone Dud. I'm one of the two secretaries general of the European Music Council. And my colleague, Katharina Weinert, policy advisor, will be happy to give you more insight into the EU cultural policy jungle. Um, so this webinar will focus on how um, decisions are being taken with regards to culture and music on a European Union level, because as you might know, um, culture is actually a priority of the member states. So um, there's still some leverage for culture and music on a European Union level, and we would like to give you some background information on that. And also in the end, a little bit of um, information uh, what this actually can mean for concrete advocacy work. Hello to everybody also from my side. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, so Simona already explained kind of what the intention is, and here you can see kind of the uh, the different aspects we're going to go through. So we're going to do an, a very short introduction to the EU institutions um, uh, that we deal with when we talk about EU cultural policy, different forms of cooperation um, that exist, more structural forms. We will talk about kind of the mm. very basic documents uh, for EU cultural policy, the European Agenda for Culture and the Council Work Plan. Um, we will talk about funding for culture and music, but more in the overarching sense, how the programs are organized, what the intentions, how they work. Um, and in the end, kind of to wrap it up um, and um, summarize again what's ahead, because like Simona said, we want to especially take a look at aspects what's what's changing now, what's happening now, um, because, um, yeah, we're at a bit of a crossroads right now um, uh, on a lot of these aspects. Okay, so as kind of the baseline about EU cultural policy, what we always have to remember is that um, the EU member states are still responsible for their own policies for the cultural sector. So um, that's what we call the subsidiarity principle. So it's all solely in the responsibility of the member states. The EU cannot impose anything on culture. That's different to, for example, trade policies, where um, the EU can make certain rules and regulations that all member states have to follow or translate into their national law. In culture, it's really all on the member states. Um, and that's also where we can see that only in 1992, with the Treaty of Maastricht, the first time that culture was actually um, introduced into the treaties of the EU, um, now in the Treaty of Lisbon, that's, often, that's always referred to as Article 167. So every time we see something on EU culture, it's often referred to as this article because that gives the EU some um, framework uh, to do certain things on culture. Um, and then in 2007, the European Agenda for Culture was adopted and it was the first time that the European Commission put forward a cultural policy strategy. And this European Agenda for Culture was then renewed in 2018. And as you saw before in the overview, we will go more into detail uh, what this actually says and what this means. Um, so when we talk about EU institutions, we have this lovely overview here. So how do all these different institutions work together? It can be very complex because it's not something that most of us deal with on a daily basis. So at the center, you see the European Commission and um, small disclaimer, um, it's not the most updated chart because it still has 28 commissioners. Of course, now it's 27 since the UK has left um, the European Union. So we have the European Commission at the center. And the European Commission are the ones, they propose the legislation, they make a proposal for the budget. And I always say this is maybe a difference what you know from the national level where this often come, can come also out of the parliament. On EU level, that's not the case. So all these proposals always start from the Commission. And then the European Parliament and the EU Council, which is where the member states' governments are directly represented, jointly decide on legislation and budget. This goes around in many circles, many times usually when we talk about either legislation or funding programs. 
So, but that's where it all starts. But in the end, the last word is really in the council by the member states. And what you can see here on the right in this white box, you see input, feedback and lobbying and legislation from, for example, civil society, um, parliamentary hearings. And this is where we really as um, as sector, civil society sector, as EMC and many other networks and organizations, be it on European or national level, that's where we are. So in all of these steps to the Commission, the Parliament and the Council, of course, we try to give our input and influence um, what is decided on EU level. So, um, like I said, the Commission is a bit at the center because that's where it all starts. They shape the overall EU strategy, they make proposals for new laws and policies. Um, and for us um, in the music sector and of course the wider cultural sector, the commissioner who is responsible is Maria Gabriel um, and her portfolio is quite large. It includes innovation, research, culture, education and youth. Um, and there's another commissioner, one of the vice presidents um, in the hierarchy of things um, who's also responsible for culture with the title promoting our European way of life, whatever that may mean. And um, then so in the commission, we have the commissioner, which is a little bit like a minister on national level. And the ministers work with the so called directorate generals. Um, for culture, we have the directorate general education and culture. And um, I just want to show you here a bit on this um, power structure. Um, in red, you can see the vice president, Margarite Skinas. And in the hierarchy below him is Maria Gabriel, who has the culture portfolio. You can see because of her large portfolio, there's actually two directorate generals. For example, the one on, the one on research and innovation and the one on education, oh. youth, sport and culture that both deal with her portfolios. Yeah, and just maybe also as a kind of addition to the commission. So this is what's the the normal way, you know, this is the, the structure and this is where culture is actually placed structurally. But if you go back to the wonderful top down slide, um, you can actually see that Ursula von der Leyen, as a president of the European Commission, um, she has introduced, and some of you will know, the new European Bauhaus uh, movement. And this is also an initiative that is um, promoted as being a bottom-up initiative uh, where uh, culture and sustainability are really high uh, on the agenda, are in focus. But this is a really kind of a side thing coming from the top that is not yet completely integrated into this usual structure, you know, DG, uh, EAG normally dealing with culture, but of course now they will also have to work a lot with this um, new European Bauhaus idea from Ursula von der Leyen. And uh, so we will probably also come back to that later a bit. So this is, this is something kind of an add on, which is not so much reflected structurally. Yeah. yeah, and politically, of course, the commissioners are responsible, but for example, for us, uh, when we do our policy work, when we talk about how is Creative Europe working, um, for example, we talk to people more directly in the DG EAG, as we call it, the Director General for Education and Culture, and not necessarily directly with the commissioner and her cabinet, but it's really on a working level, it's always the DG EAG we, uh, we refer to and um, um, yeah, we, we are mostly in contact with. Then uh, next we have the European Parliament, which now has 70, uh, 705 members and it represents the citizens of the member states and all the MEPs, the members of the parliament are directly uh, directly elected um, in the member states. They jointly adopt laws and the budget of the European Union. They're supposed to supervise all activities. And um, also there is, of course, in their structure two um, um, bodies, so to say, that are most important for us, that's the Committee on Culture and Education and the Cultural and Creators Friendship Group. Um, but before I come to them, just to give you an overview, 705 divided into different political groups. Most political parties that you know from um, 
your own countries, you will find them in one of these groups. So the biggest one, the EPP, that's the um, European People's Party. Um, then the second biggest, the Social Democrats, for example, you have Renew, which are the Liberals, the Greens, and so on and so on. Um, so they form across the different member states, they form, they group according to their political affiliation. And I mentioned before that we have in the Parliament the Committee on Culture and Education. They are responsible for all cultural aspects um, of the EU. So, for example, when the Commission makes a proposal for a new Creative Europe program, then it first goes to the Culture and Education Committee. They um, write their report on it or make suggestions for changes. When it goes into the negotiations, it will be people from the Culture and Education Committee who are responsible for it before, in the end, something goes to the um, plenary of the parliament to elect it. So they are really the ones who very concretely um, work on these cultural related proposals that come from the Commission. But what they also often do on their own initiative, um, they adopt resolutions or own initiative reports, which don't have any direct consequences necessarily in terms of legislations or laws, but they can try with these resolutions or reports influence and put pressure on the Commission or the member states to do something. For example, we had um, uh, not too long ago, this resolution on the cultural recovery of the EU that came out from, uh, started in the Committee on Culture and Education, um, or we have um, a report on the status and working conditions of artists, for example, um, and that's on their own initiative because they want to um, highlight certain topics for the cultural sector. Yeah, and I put here uh, just maybe because they're interested, because each political group um, has somebody in the culture committee who is the main first contact person for cultural topics. Yeah. So this is actually also interesting for you. If you want to do some uh, advocacy work on, on your part, it's probably both. You should have a look who is the parliamentarian from your country and in which community, uh, which committee is he or she sitting. Um, then, of course, always they, of course, also still have their home bases. So they are also, you know, really strongly connected to where they come from. So this is something where you can have a close look at. And then, of course, also at the parties, the list that you see here. And this is, of course, also for us when we do advocacy work with the MEPs, the parliamentarians, this is where we contact most of them, write our emails, our letters too. So this is our main interlocutors also in, in, in the parliament, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, that was one too many. Um, and the other group I mentioned before is the Cultural and Creators Friendship Group. This is really an informal group. So this is not, not really an institution, official institution, but by the parliament. But there were several members of the parliament um, at the uh, beginning of their term who said um, the cultural sector or cultural and creative industries we think it's really important and we want to find, we want to get together to really um, help support the cultural ecosystem and uh, working conditions and so, and so forth. So it's a cross-partisan group, supranational. So it includes 28 members from six different political groups and across 14 different countries. Um, and they really operate as a forum for discussion and cooperation. So they, uh, they have their manifesto and a working plan. So either they will sometimes together write open letters on certain issues. They um, also write together amendments for different reports or legislations that's currently going through the parliament. They also organize events and, and discussions and are really also active, for example, on social media to really keep issues of the cultural sector as part of the discussion. Yeah. So they can be also an interesting source of information because, of course, as parliamentarians, they have access to certain information and they often very early on flag certain issues that might come up. And one, they have some six main areas of work that they define, but they're really most active on everything on labor rights, social and working conditions. That's kind of their main focus right now. 
and they are also really open to discuss with the civil society. So um, we have been invited already before, but also now um, on 12th of October, uh, Katharina will attend a meeting of the Culture and Creators Friendship Group and where she will uh, participate in a meeting on the working conditions of artists. So this is really an important group for us also to, to interact with. Yeah, and from the parliament now we come to the council or so to say how the member states um, are based in this whole EU institutional system. So first here where you always have to be careful because we have several councils. So I want to uh, uh, really more focus here on the council of the EU which is made up of representatives of each member state at ministerial level. So for our area, we have education, youth, culture and sports, where then, for example, all the cultural ministers from each country meet. Um, and also everything that I just said for the culture and education committee in the parliament, all these, for example, creative Europe or other issues that some affect um, the cultural se sector will be discussed here. Of course, they can also put um, their own topics and issues on the um, agenda um, as well uh, and adopt council um, resolutions. Um, overall, um, they of course adopt all legislation that maybe comes through that affects their areas, prepare decisions, but overall what's important to note, most of, most of what they do, except maybe for Creative Europe, is non-binding. Um, so these are mostly recommendations, conclusions, because when we go back to the beginning, culture is the responsibilities of the member states. The EU cannot impose anything here. So this is very much, a lot of things are on incentive measures, recommendations on a voluntary basis. And they, of course, meet, uh, I don't want to say anything wrong, I think maybe for, maximum four times a year, maybe three times a year, the ministers, but on a more working level day-to-day -day basis, we have the Cultural Affairs Committee with the nice abbreviation CAC. Um, these are, um, they prepare the work of the ministers, they discuss this more on a regular basis, and these are mostly from the permanent representations based in Brussels, um, the representative of the member states who meet in this format. Um, then, of course, we have other councils, general affairs, where it's often the, um, and they also discuss cross-cutting issues, especially when we talked about the budget negotiations a while ago, um, this was more important. But then what you probably in the news hear most about is the European Council. Um, and that's where the heads of states and the governments meet. So that's where you also always have these nice pictures and the arrivals at the door with the interviews and everything. They, of course, set out the general guidelines, but that's different from the council. The council of the EU is the ministers, um, depending on their topic for culture. There's, of course, also one for um, agriculture and so on and so on. And the European Council, that's really the overarching flashy more in the, in the news that you always see. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not really, uh, I don't know in the chat if there are any questions or not, because then otherwise, yeah, Simona, I'll then we hand over to you. On and you just shout out whenever there is something. So, um, so these are the institutions now. How do they interact? Actually, you know, the institutions they have, of course, as Katarina was just as mentioning, the member states with the with the council, um, but they also have another form of co cooperation with the member states, which which is the open method of coordination. And you will find in EU jargon a lot of talks of the OMC groups, the OMC groups. So they are uh, working groups with representatives of member states on certain topics, and uh, also in the council work plan for culture, they. Uh, introduce what topics they will address in an OMC group in the future. So we will come back to that later. Currently, we are in the council work plan um, that runs until 2022. And the next one, 23 to 26, is just about to be negotiated. So this is where topics are 
subscribed, inscribed, and then the groups will meet and the member states uh, will send experts to these groups. And the key idea is really to exchange good practices, to really inspire each other, but also to, to produce policy manuals and toolkits. So it's, it's a really, I think, really a lot about exchanging and getting inspired by each other with regards to cultural topics. But as again, it's EU uh, framework, nothing is binding. Um, and so there, it, it really depends a bit on what topic you are working on. Um, so it's, it can also happen that you have a topic where not all member states will send an expert. So, however, if you look for the current topic, which is status and working conditions of the artists, this is very important for the member states. So each member state here has actually sent an expert. So, but this can vary a lot uh, according to the topics that you will discuss. And there is also, it also varies really the, the, the member states and the ministries for culture actually really decide what kind of expert they actually want to send. So it can be a usual suspect, someone that we know from civil society, because they feel that this person actually is an expert on working conditions. Maybe it's a person from a, a, a union for, uh, Maybe that would they wouldn't really pick a union person, but you know they 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 can take they can pick experts from the field, but some other ministries would actually pick a ministry employee who is more kind of leaning towards the bureaucratic side. It's it's not to say that they are not knowledgeable, but it so you can have a very mixed group. And of course this this it both both have their advantages. So of course when the first reflex might be to say, oh that's great if you have an expert from civil society that really is very knowledgeable about the topic. This is great for the content work. But the question sometimes is how does this actually then feed back to the national policy and national legislation? You know, is is there really the exchange will that really have the same impact as an expert that is directly connected to the ministry and actually working at a ministry so you have so the it's it, there is no good or bad in that of course the ideal is if you have an expert working at the ministry but that's because there is such a vast um field of topics that's that's rare to find for all the topics so this is a bit you know how are these omc groups put together and as i said it's not every country always sending someone. So they, they are really quite varied. And as said, everything is again, non-binding. And you can see um, that, for example, there was a, um, a survey from the uh, EU Commission analysis among member states um, where they asked them, okay, uh, on the role of the OMC and all member states were invited to particip participate. And so some said, well, actually it was really good because um, the, the, the communities and networks have developed as a result. So really their, their knowledge has increased. So that was a very good and important aspect. And um, also that, that it was really good to, to see how the OMC uh, really depends uh, on the topics that is related to the policy priorities of a member state. So if, for example, um, working conditions is also high on the agenda of a ministry of culture in a member state, then the police, the OMC group will have a very big impact or can have a very big impact. So it's 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 it, it can be very beneficial, but it can also be not so beneficial because on the other side, also the same report also states that um, a vast majority of the member states did not use more than five out of 10 um, OMC reports for their policy making. So it's it's both sides, right? It's it's it depends. You can say it depends, right? So but it's 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 important for us to know that this is happening and that of course it can shape policy making. Um, and so at the moment, as I already said, there is the status and working conditions of the artists, and you also have um, a report that has a very flashy title, Stormy Times, Nature and Humans, the Cultural College for Change. That is actually the report of the OMC Group for Culture and Sustainability. And um, so you will find, of course, reports of these OMC groups um, that are published. So you can have a look on what they worked. And then um, on the other side, as a counterpart, so to say, um, we have the voices of culture. And this is uh, where the civil society meets and to talk about 
similar topics. The, 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 the aim is to strengthen the advocacy capacity of the cultural sectors in the policy debate. And it has started a long, a long, long time ago. Uh, and uh, it was this whole this whole topic, Voices of Culture and OMC, in, in earlier communication, you will find them labeled as structured dialogue. You know, we were saying this is kind of forms of cooperation. And that was when people earlier talked about structured dialogue in an EU context with regards to culture, they meant OMC groups and Voices of Culture. I think the the structured dialogue label is lost a little bit more now. Um, it was inscribed in the first European agenda for culture very much as a real tool to engage with civil society and member states on cultural issues. So this is the civil society engagement. And um, so there are a lot of topics that are currently on place and a lot of topics that have already been, um, you know, talked about and reports produced for you find this big list I don't need to um, repeat it and here it's a little bit the same story with the OMC it depends so some of these um, reports are very very good and they are very uh, knowledgeable and especially I think it takes also some time especially when you look at, at how it uh, developed or evolved the process of the voices of culture what is a very good thing is that at the beginning the OMC group had its topics and the Voices of Culture had its topics and sometimes they were in parallel and now more and more they are actually really aligned, more aligned, and they also refer to each other. So for example, that the status and working conditions of artists, um, there the um, report is already out. Um, and the if you remember, the current topic of the OMC is also status and working conditions of artists. And of course, the OMC is closely looking at this report of civil society and will probably also hopefully take over some key recommendations and also include it in their work. So this is this is the ideal way that um, the civil society topics and OMC topics actually interact and influence each other. And also um, in this Voices of Culture process, there's always an open call. You, you see the web website here, the current uh, meeting will be next week next week right um in brussels so we are as emc we are also a partner our board member harry van den elsen will take place in this meeting and as a member you will know i hope you all have seen that we always invite you to give a feedback to um really you know share your best practices so this is what we then bring to the table in these debates so whenever we are so we mostly apply to all voices of culture topics that are published. And then when we are accepted, because there is a, an evaluation process to is when we are accepted to be a partner, a conversation partner in the voices of culture, then we will always involve you, our members, and ask what's what's important for you in that topic. And then we bring that back to the table. So that's the voices of culture. Again, it's it's really difficult to measure how much it actually influences but sometimes it really does also for gender equality it was also there was the voices of culture report was first and then we had a meeting with the omc group together actually or with partly some members of the omc group and they they were very receptive of the report of the voices of culture so it it can it can have an impact it's just not always the case any questions on that. If not, we just continue. Okay, yeah, we mentioned um, it now several times, the European Agenda for Culture, I'll start with that. Like I said, it's the cultural policy strategy of the European Commission. The current one we have was published in May 2018, and it was the second one of its kind. Because the European Agenda for Culture, there is no, it doesn't have a time frame. It, it doesn't define this runs from this date until this date. Um, so far, they have not done that. Um, so that's the Euro new European Agenda for Culture now that we're working with. Um, it includes 
25 actions in three strategic objectives and two cross-cutting dimensions. So the strategic objectives are the uh, social, economic, and external dimension of culture. Cross-cutting is cultural heritage and digital. And overall, the aim is to harness the power of culture and cultural diversity for social cohesion and well-being, support jobs and growth, and strengthen international cultural relations. And um, you see here it has 25 actions, but the implementation relies heavily on existing programs. Um, as you, um, if you look at all 25 actions, you will see that a lot of it is okay. Include a certain priority in Erasmus Plus, for example, in, 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 uh, have a culture and creative priority in Erasmus Plus, for example. Um, um, many things like that. So since this has already been um, in um, in action since 2018, here are some uh, examples of those 25 actions where they have now been implemented um, to a certain extent. So for example, a mobility scheme um, for artists and professionals, we had a pilot action, which was called iPortunus. And now we have this, which is, it's called now Culture Moves Europe. So mobility funding as part of Creative Europe. So this was set as an, as an action aim in 2018 and has now been done. Um, research on uh, culture, health and well-being. That's a study that's now being done at the moment where Culture Action Europe is um, the lead partner. Um, and EIT, EIT is the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. So they have now, um, it was over the summer, was selected a new knowledge and innovation community on culture. Um, the next one you see here, we had a special Western Balkans call for the culture and creative sector, an action plan for cultural heritage. And the music item, specific music item that was included in the last European Agenda for Culture, um, was this regular dialogue um, with the music sector and to carry out a preparatory action for Music Most Europe. And how that has worked out, we will look at in the end um, um, of our webinar. But so that you're already aware, this was a goal that was al also already set um, in the European Agenda for Culture. So now we see the first one um, was in tw 2007 and the new one only came in 2018, so only 11 years later. Um, we now hear, um, so the parliament is actually um, right now working on an, their own report where they analyze the, the European agenda for culture, what has worked, what should be done to renew it. Um, and the meeting of the Culture and Education Committee is next week on Monday, where they will adopt their own report and kind of their position and statement on the European agenda for culture. And it seems like that um, it's expected that the Commission will launch and also their own evaluation um, of the European Agenda for Culture um, and then possibly follow it up with also a updated, renewed European Agenda for Culture um, early next year. But um, that's, that's to be seen, but that's kind of what we expect a little bit, that there will be a renewal coming up because all these, these 25 actions that I've included there refer to a lot of activities from 2018 to maybe 20, 2021. So um, yeah, we expect some new actions there. Yeah, and maybe as you said, like example of action. So Music News Europe was really actually included in the text of the new European Agenda for Culture. So that's really important that music was part of it, explicitly mentioned where I think before it was basically performing arts, um, culture and creative industries. So to have this this in there is, is quite uh, something that will probably be important to keep on uh, advocating for when we look at whatever is the new, when the new negotiations will start or, or consultations, because again, for the first um, European Agenda for Music that was published in 2008, EMC and the civil society stakeholders were very much involved and really also invited to in-person consultations and online questionnaires were sent out the same now for the last one, the new European Agenda for Culture. And we hope, of course, whatever the, the midterm review would, would bring with it and if they consider, and we are very much... <laughs> 
convinced that this will happen, especially with COVID and the Ukraine crisis. I think so many parameters have changed now. We are in a really, the world has changed tremendously. So this will be revised, we are sure of. And then we hope to be at the table of conversations again. Yeah, and so that was what comes from the um, commission the agenda for culture and the council work plan is what comes from the member states um, and the council work plan different to the European agenda for culture it's predefined has a, a predefined term so the current one um, started in 2019 and runs until the end of the year basically and it's the main topics and working methods for policy coll collaboration defined by the member states so even though they say of course it's not EU responsibility, we still want to exchange and maybe coordinate on, on certain issues. Um, and we have these five areas in the current council work plan on sustainability and cultural heritage, cohesion and well-being, an ecosystem supporting artists, cultural and creative professionals and European content, gender equality and international cultural relations. So, and also horizontal issues here are digitization and cultural statistics. So you can see there is of course, a certain amount of overlap also with the European agenda for culture, um, but also maybe where they place a different, something more at the center than um, maybe um, others do. And here I would just want to point out that in this part C, ecosystem supporting artists and so on, there is also a topic specifically on music, which is called diversity and competitiveness of the music sector. Um, and what specifically was done in 2019 under the Romanian presidency, um, there was um, a conference held in Bucharest, which looked had a very strong focus on copyright, but that's kind of what they now say, okay, this is what we done on it, we organized this conference, because like, I, like I, it says here, it defines the working methods. So these working methods can be conferences, they can be workshops, they can be council conclusions, which are also more recommendations. So these are more kind of the formats that come, come out of the council work plan um, on culture. And of course, um, as Simone explained, they also define, um, can define the topics that are discussed in the open method um, for coordination, for example. And like I said, uh, as you see, until 2022, so we expect a new council work plan on culture for 2023 to 2026. Um, it will be adopted um, in November. Um, and the first discussions have started now under the Czech Council Presidency uh, this month. And there will be also some more meetings um, in October, where, of course, first proposals the member states have already made their first ideas, put their first ideas together. Um, um, so, of course, now that's an important time now. Oh, yeah, so the yeah, just quickly again on the on the important time. So we know that the next meetings are on five and eighteen October, and then they want to finalize uh, the the work plan. And um, so for us, it's really also an important time now to say, okay, music should continue to be included in that council work plan. Um, so we will, we will need to reach out and maybe together with you also to um, the member states, the ministries of culture who deal with EU affairs to um, convince them, okay, look, music is an important part of the overall council work plan on culture alongside, for example, with, if you see on other streamlined, uh, as you said, horizontal issues, probably with sustainability topics, et cetera. So, so this is things that we should um, talk about when we talk about advocacy. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's very much expected that um, topics like the working conditions will, will feature in the new council work plan. Of course, COVID recovery will probably also play a role. So there are some topics that are expected and but from kind of the the chatter we hear uh, it seems that a lot of sectors are also pushing a lot for very sector specific items it is of course remains to be seen of if the member 
states also um, um, will follow that and adopt it. But here we're very much now, and uh, it's crunch time now, so to say, um, when it comes to the next council work plan and topics to de define for the next uh, three years then. So then um, the next item we want to talk about is um, first, yeah, let's say how much how much money is actually there because cultural policy, of course, we mentioned a lot of recommendations now and exchanges and best practices, but um, where that part of culture where the EU can actually um, do something more very concretely is, of course, um, the funding they also provide for for culture that complements or is supposed to complement funding on national level um so the basis for all of that is um, um of course the overall eu budget um and here this is just to show you what we're currently operating with so the multi-annual budget of the uh, european union is called mff the multi-annual financial framework the current one runs from 2021 to 2027, which you can see here in blue here, that's the regular normal EU budget. And with COVID now, what you see in orange here, there was some additional funding um, um, through um, additional sources for very specific COVID recovery measures, but we now wanna focus more on um, what is being done in the, in the normal budget, let's say in the MFF. So, like I said, it's a regular budget. Um, I always stumble over these gigantic numbers. So it's 1.2 trillion euro um, for everything the EU does. Research, agriculture, regional development, everything. But of course, it also includes small programs, comparatively small programs like um, Creative Europe. And um, because it started in 2021. So we're coming uh, close to now uh, already the half time um, of the program and we expect a midterm review of the overall MFF that will be probably done over the course of the next year um, and then should latest be ready by um, January 2024 um, where it will be assessed how, how everything is working and maybe a chance for changes, we'll see. So Creative Europe, that's the EU's funding program um, dedicated for to the cultural and audiovisual sector, I should say. For 2021 to 2027, we have a budget of uh, 1.8 billion euro. Creative Europe is made up of three main strands, media, which is the funding for the audiovisual sector. So it's film and video games. Then we have our culture strand um, and then also the something that's called cross-sector strand. And you can see here the budget, 58% media that goes to the audiovisual sector, 33% for culture and then 9% for cross-sector. And um, so of course the objectives and priorities and the structure of the program has been agreed upon for the whole time frame. But in annual work programs, um, it's more defined what calls will be published in a certain year, how much, how big is the budget for um, a specific year, because it can vary from year to year how big the annual budget is. Yeah, and that's where also a lot is happening right now. And Simone, I'll turn to you for that. <laughs> yeah, so um, you see the numbers here. So and you see this front loaded program. Um, so it's actually a lot of money that has already been spent and or is planned to be spent also in 2023. And um, so we also did a little bit of the calculation. And uh, unfortunately, if if it's front loaded, then in the upcoming years, there is less money available. Um, and there is currently um, from the EU Parliament an opinion, and they will have a meeting of the cult committee next Monday on 3rd of October, where they discuss this opinion um, and the dis with decisions and amount and decisions is expected, but there are also already amendments to this opinion expressed. And um, so the, the, the key message of the opinion is you should not cut the Creative Europe budget um, for 2023. 
because if you see, so this is only the, the, the view on culture, but I also have the, the overall um, numbers. So if, for example, if you compare the overall Creative Europe budget, 22 is 395 um, million euros spent. And then in 2023 or earmarked and in tw for 23, it's 311. So actually really quite a degrees, decrease by 80 million. Now, um, there are several reasons for this uh, decrease. And um, of course, while we would always definitely want to uh, really, I mean, support all uh, parliaments or political um, initiatives that ask for more money for culture, we have a lot of questions on that. And we would like to ask these questions because if you really do the maths and say, okay, there is this overall envelope of 1.8 billion euro. And if you do the maths, what has been spent already or is planned to be spent, including, you know, what is allocated to 2023, um, you have for the, for the four remaining years of the overall Creative Europe program, you only have uh, 837 million euros left, which would actually mean then per, four, per year, broken down per year, around 209 million. So this is a much heavier decrease if you look, you know, at 2023. I mean, you know, looking at the overall budget. So if, if 2023, the overall numbers, I'm sorry if I'm looking now at, was 311 mil million. And then as of 24, if everything stays the same, you only have 209 million euro left for each year that follows. So we don't really understand. So this is actually an open question for the time being. We don't really understand how this can continue. I mean, why we would really love to support uh, the parliament in their claim to ask uh, to 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 um, ask for more money for Creative Europe. We are not sure if it's really a good idea to say the budget should not be cut, the budget should be at least as it was in 2022. And because um, it's an overall program for seven years, and if we spend all the money in the first years, we just don't have anything left for the last years. And we just want to um, raise this question to the parliamentarians, because this will be very important for the future. I mean, there's there's rougher times, I think, ahead for cultural funding at all levels, uh, when you look at the bigger picture uh, where societies are. So we are not, we, we just have these questions. So um, that's about where we currently stand. So this meeting and this parliamentary opinion will be discussed on Monday in the cult committee. And the least what we will do is just ask questions. We cannot have a real opinion here ourselves because I mean, if there's more money lying around somewhere for Creative Europe, we're always in for more money. But what we just want to understand if, if they just want more money now and then then we will pity it or then we then we have lost for the for the last four years then we would not say it's it's good to actually ask for this increase already now so this is uh, on the current state with creative europe and the budget for 2023 so some questions that we don't have an answer to yet uh, and maybe on that, which I didn't say uh, when I talked about the cult committee in general, all the meetings of the culture and education committee are always live streamed um, on the website of the European Parliament or also are recorded. So you can also go back and watch um, meetings if you maybe missed it or some some former meetings. So there you can follow um, the debate um i mean sometimes it's only they vote on stuff and then it's over quite quickly but some where they really discuss certain issues often also the somebody from the commission and then it's usually somebody from the dg eax or the director of general education and culture is in the committee to present a proposal by the commission or um, explain um, certain things if the parliamentarians have questions so for those who want to dive a bit deeper into this this can be um, can be quite interesting just to to watch it online and um, one thing I wanted to add because I just saw the um, question in the chat from from Sandra about um, member states and yeah of course this is like Simona already said this is EU member states but there is um, 
there, there are several occasions also where non-EU member states are involved. Um, for example, even in the OMC groups, in the open methods of coordination, as far as we know, in the past, there have been a few topics where some partner countries, mostly from the European free trade area, so maybe Norway um, or Iceland, have been invited to participate, even uh, on, on debate uh, um, in this area. Um, but especially in Creative Europe, there is a a uh, long list of uh, non-EU countries that are associated with the program, participate in the program. Um, it's, for example, many non-EU member states on the Balkans, um, but also even uh, Ukraine, for example, participates in the program as well. Um, so that can be, um, there can be several opportunities for um, non-EU member states um, to take part. So just wanted to add that here yeah so then from creative europe we're jumping to oh yeah there we are um to music most europe so what actually is music most europe um so we put here two quotes for how the commission themselves describe what music most europe is so they say it's the framework for the european commission's initiatives and actions in support of the european music sector and the ultimate goal is to, to develop an integrated EU policy approach on music. So music most Europe actually um, encompasses several aspects. So it's funding on the one hand, um, we first had, um, we will look at the funding a bit more. So I'll skip that maybe for now. Um, we have um, policy. So for example, the presidency conference that I mentioned on uh, music for, uh, and there was another one uh, last year so some co uh, conferences organ that the commission organizes for mostly participants by the member states which are often also close to the public that's what they define under policy um, legal environment here the commission especially um, talks about the copyright directive um, that was adopted a few years ago and that the member states now translate into national law or, or supposed to have done so by now. Um, that's what they mostly mention, but of course it can, uh, can also be in other um, areas which are more um, uh, kind of the legal framework of the EU. At the moment, a lot of things about the digital single market uh, negotiated and of course that's not inherently only a cultural uh, or music issue it's of course a lot bigger but it can be everything digital single market and services uh, when we look at especially the big platforms and music streaming can have a really big impact on uh, how the music the music sector the overall music um, ecosystem operates um, so that's also an aspect the dialogue um, the Commission has promised um, that there will be a structured dialogue, not only the voices of culture, but what we have for the overall culture sector, but uh, one for the music sector with the European Commission. There have been a few years ago, one, maybe two meetings, but now um, the Commission is uh, has published this call uh, to organize the dialogue, so that's a bit... Um, sleeping let's say um, and we also have the music museum talent awards so that's what the commission currently describes as music Mus Europe. so they could describe it as a framework that includes many different things on policy on legislation on funding um, and so on yeah and we are currently a bit alert um, because we feel like there is kind of a decline going on with this Music Moves Europe um, overall framework at the European Commission uh, because they're not very consistent themselves in, in how the Commission is communicating Music Moves Europe and um, especially what Katarina was saying, the dialogue was very, very strong in preparation of Music Moves Europe. There were the so-called AB working groups. There was really a dialogue with, with representatives from the sector looking what is actually needed because the music sector is such a strong sector. It's a very big part of the, of the cultural 
world in Europe, also with regards to um, the economic economic factor of of the music industries. So um, there was there were these A B working groups that then you know resulted in the Music Moves Europe preparatory action with concrete funding, um, but now we have that and we feel a little bit. Um, we, we are unsure. Again, we don't have answers. We more have questions and this will also be coming up in what, what to do. We need to talk to the Commission. What are their plans with regards to the future of Music Moves Europe? Because it seems to be less and less a priority, which is a great, at, at least that's, you know, that's, that's our understanding um, or our yeah, it's a, more a feeling because it has been very high on the agenda and it's it's less and less. Uh, if you look at, you know, for 23, there is no no Music Move Europe call anymore, probably because there are big calls currently up now. But it's so so let's let's look at that further um, and really for us to to investigate a little bit where where is it going in terms of priority at the European Commission level. Yeah, so it started with very big promises and um, so we first had what then very concretely um, happened after these um, meetings starting in 2015 the the very first concrete thing that happened was this so-called preparatory action a preparatory action is kind of um, an, an opportunity or chance to test certain new funding strands um, so there is some um, additional money to the existing uh, funding programs to say kind of okay we want to test something out how they work is it taken up by the target groups how do these projects actually do they make sense do they fulfill some of the objectives and priorities that they have and with then in the end the aim to integrate funding like this into existing funding programs so and they can these preparatory actions can run for maximum three years which they did in the case of the music most europe preparatory action which so we had um, in 2018 in 2019 and in 2020 um calls um, um for for this preparatory action so and i kind of i divided them a bit here in two groups um so the first one, um, or maybe I should say before I say that, it was overall, over these three years, um, 7 million euros that went um, into um, this preparatory action. Um, and so for the first group that you see here, starting with training scheme for young music professionals until the cooperation of small music venues, these were what you maybe would expect as this typical call for proposals that the European Commission publishes where you can apply with um, your small project. And then in each of these strands, several projects were funded. Overall, it was in these, uh, how many is it? Six, um, 60 uh, small scale uh, projects were funded um, um, in these actions. And then what you see a bit here is in the second group, starting with the feasibility study until the last point, the innovative support scheme for a sustainable music ecosystem. All of these calls um, were um, to select one consortium, one entity to carry out this action. So they were a bit different. So in um, all of the others, on average, 10 projects um, were selected for funding. And in the second group, it would, went to one consortium uh, to fulfill a certain task. So we have, of course, a few studies here, feasibility studies to study on a European music export strategy, um, the health and well-being of music creator study was supposed to be published in early 2022. So far, I have not seen it. If for some reason one of you knows anything about this, but that's, for example, uh, also one of these things that we have an issue with. It's sometimes it's kept really under the radar and it's not really published, promoted by the European Commission. So we don't know what happened with that. And the last that you see here, Innovative Support Scheme for Sustainable Music Ecosystem. This is where uh, we as EMC uh, applied with Innova um, from Portugal, where we now, what you probably know as Music Air, um, distribute grants to the music sector further. Yeah. So this is kind of what happened with the 
what happened in the preparatory action to kind of see test what um, what could possibly be done in Creative Europe. So now uh, the new Creative Europe program started in 2021. And now um, we are looking at what has happened with this Music Most Europe actions in, in Creative Europe. And so far, two calls have been published. Um, one call um, was on dialogue and cooperation in the context of Music Most Europe. So this was again a call where the Commission is looking for one consortium to carry out this dialogue with the music sector. That call closed uh, a few months ago, just really uh, recently, not that long ago. So we don't have any results yet. Um, and the second call that is open right now is for um, looking again for one consortium. So they will only give, the commission will only give out one brand, one contract for a sustainable music distribution with a focus on live music. Again, this is rather more where the commission is looking for a consortium that will further distribute smaller grants. Um, and you can see here, so the first the dialogue was 300,000 euro. And now the second one that's open right now is um, 4.5 million euro. And that's all we've seen so far of this music sector specific action in Creative Europe. And that's that's where we are right now. Yeah. And this is maybe also a little bit, you know, why we are not so sure, why we have our questions um, on on um, the actions. The, there is this dialogue call, um, but we would rather have a dialogue that is directly steered by the com commission. So there is a call that is now closed and we have not applied for it because we don't want to be put in this position of being um, the intermediary between uh, the commission and the civil society sector because we are the civil society with with you and our members and we are not uh we are not a kind of a middlesman for the european commission to to do the dialogue to organize the dialogue that they should actually lead with us directly from within themselves um and then this this new call is quite heavy with 4.5 million euro it's a lot of money and it has a very narrow focus also, um, and it it has a similar structure like the music air. You know this this last preparatory action that uh, Katarina has just um, shown to you, where we partner with Innova Plus. Uh, we see it's it's of course on the one side it's very good to be in the position to shape and to really consult with the music sector to to make tailor made uh, call for proposals, but it's it's also um, a big question mark um, if actually a network uh, a membership network such as the European Music Council is 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 really um, should should we really do the administrative work. I think, yes, we are there to consult. We are there to give our input, the content input, but but is it really us to do all the administration and to really set up contracts and to, it's, it's kind of a service. And so this is uh, the, the European Commission has in their new Creative Europe program that's now in place with 2021 in the, in the work plans that we were talking about there, the new thing that everybody was talking about was the cascading grants. Ah, they will do a lot of cascading grants. And we are not uh, at the moment at the European Music Council level, not so convinced if the way that these cascading grants are actually interpreted or put into concrete calls is, is what is actually needed. We need a dialogue. We need a, a dialogue with the commission on how calls should look like, what the music sector actually needs. Um, but to do the 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 whole the whole line until the contracting until you know doing the financial administration all that is of course easy for the commission but difficult for us that's what i would say so in a nutshell what what actually so does is is lying ahead of us if if you look at all the topics that that we have tried to run through it's probably really a lot and i just realized it's still very technical though we really try to make it as as understandable as possible so what what's coming up um the 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 most important really or not the most important very important is of course midterm and long-term strategies so 
we will have to be very carefully looking at the next review of the overall financial framework, the multi-annual financial framework, as you see as a first point. And what does this then also mean, this kind of review for the Creative Europe budget? Because as, as explained before, it's a front-loaded program. A lot of money has already been spent or is planned to be spent in the first three years. So what will that mean for the last four years? And if there is a chance, of course, to increase the budget substantially, that would be great. And these are two things that are really important for us to have on our mind and on our radar. Then we have uh, music in the council work plan. As said, you know, the new work plan that will also most likely shape OMC topics, topics for OMC working groups. So um, the new one running then from 23 to 26, if you remember, 5 and 18 October are the next meetings. So there we really should say music should be included as because as Katarina has said, just uh, said, other like books, I think, for example, other other areas will also be included in that. So music should also be included in that. So we have to try and, and get music in there. And then if the new European agenda for culture will get a new version, which we which is very likely because an evaluation of the current will be done soon. And then most likely it will come to a conclusion that a new new European agenda for culture is needed, then we also will have to be prepared. So this is, a, again, having it on our radar, a more long-term uh, strategic view, not to, to lose sight of that, especially, for example, if it could happen that uh, there is no public consultation, because we see actually this dialogue, like I said before, it has been strong in the past. It 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 starts to get less. It's at the, at the moment dialogue is not uh, that strong. So we, we really need to keep an eye on that. And then what I also have dis explained to you, this, this overall dialogue with Music Moves Europe um, is something that we need to lead with the European Commission um, and also with other people involved in that because it has been a preparatory action and normally out of a preparatory action, preparatory action there should be conclusions. You have to come to a conclusion, what went well, what did not went well, it's to prepare a future funding program as well for music. So we are now in this already new funding program with Creative Europe. So we have some sectoral actions and for music, there are still labeled Music Moves Europe, um, but we don't see actually um, a strategy or we don't see any findings from the preparatory action, what was actually felt to be important, what measures worked well, what measures were difficult, what is needed, where, which, which path should we go with the funding for music or do we need to test more? All these 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 conclusions from the preparatory action have not taken place. There is a report, but it's not drawing conclusions. So this is, uh, I think, a lot of the. So that was cultural policy, and then comes advocacy. So this is a lot of the advocacy topics that will lie ahead for EMC together with you, I would say. And now the floor is yours for more questions. Yeah, maybe just quickly on that. So on our website, we have also, uh, yeah, thank you first to Andrea for putting all the, the links also in the chat. Um, you will find also a lot of this uh, on our website in the cultural policy section. Um, yeah, but I will stop the screen sharing now. So then it's also easier to see all of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe uh, just um, building on what Simona also said, Lance, now the, the advocacy starts and that's um, maybe um, why as a, as a European network and with the strength is our members here, um, because the, of course, for, if you want to reach somebody either in the parliament, but especially in the commission, they will not be able to listen or often not willing to listen to um, several hundred from smaller institu institutions from different countries. But if we um, as, as a European network are able 
to um, channel those messages and say here you can talk to us and we have this combined knowledge of um, our members and the overall sector um, that gives us a lot of strength and then of course where the strength of uh, especially a lot of our national members comes in is their contacts on national level to their ministries um, to have the contacts there and try to influence especially policy making in the council but yeah i'll stop for now so well um i think that's it for today and for our webinar thank you katarina for your very very knowledgeable insight and thank you everyone for your um, participation for listening in for staying tuned and we hope to join forces soon and um stay tuned and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.